Okay, so now let's actually get into Ephesians. And there are various, there's different ways you can approach this. Um, you know, I started out pretty conceptual, right? That this is the vision of Bethel for us. And uh, and there's no way to avoid that. The, that the peak of the vision in the Bible actually comes out of Ephesians. Uh, if you want to, if you want to understand as a New Testament believer what we're doing here, it's in Ephesians. Um, but we also don't want to miss the edification that's personal. Uh, and there's a lot of devotional value that and heart comfort that comes, especially out of the first chapter. Um, so we'll just see how it goes. I, you know. I'm free to approach this, however, because uh, I already did it once, so I don't have to do it in an all-inclusive way and cover every point. I can just go with what I feel. <laughs> uh, okay, so, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Well, actually, I do have to say, Ephesus got the most attention in the Bible of all the churches, it seems. You know in the le first letter of the book of Revelation that Jesus writes it's to the church at Ephesus which means maiden of choice uh, and if you think about that that is amazing because God didn't supposedly name the city the Gentiles did hundreds of years before there was even such thing as a church um, but in the letters to the seven churches and I did a study on this, if you look at my Revelation playlist, but uh, each name of the city, which is the identification of the church, because the church is just the church in the city. It's not like the first Baptist church downtown and the third church of St. Joseph up in, you know, the county. No, it's, it's the church in the city, uh, identified by the fact that it's the church. And it's, a, it's the same everywhere. The only difference is that where the church is, is its designation. So the church in Ephesus, the church in Smyrna, the church in Pergamos, right? Well, each of those names of the cities ends up being a summary of the main intention of the letter that Jesus writes. Uh, and... Uh, it's just amazing. So anyway, Ephesus was named hundreds of years before by the Gentiles, supposedly. And yet in Ephesians, we learn that it's by God and Father that every name and every family name is given uh, in the whole world. So God is the sovereign author of human history. He's the one in control of all events, all places, all names, all languages, everything. It's all sovereignly arranged by him in a positive way to bring about his positive purpose, which actually in Ephesians we see is the church, which is the body of Christ, this Bethel. Uh, everything becomes raw material for God's building and is communication, a medium of communication to his saints. Um, so that's pretty interesting. And predestination has a big, uh, you know, God's fingerprints are all over the world and all over our lives. Um, and we learn about that in Ephesians. Predestination is not a Calvinist word. Calvinism hijacked the original intention of predestination. It it's not that God chooses this person is saved and that person isn't saved. No, but there is a group of people that he foreknew. And when it says God foreknew them, it doesn't mean he just knew the moment of our regeneration. Like some people say, well, that means he knew that I would choose him. No, he knows you outside of time in Christ. Um, the way I know my son is not, I actually barely remember the first moments I held him. I mean, I do, but that's not what I think about when I know my son. I've had eight years now with him. I have had trips and, uh, 
struggles and uh, teaching moments and doing things that that's my memory. My memory of him is the time I've spent with him, knowing him. That's how God knows us because for him, all of history is completed in advance. He's already done it all. He's already been there. You know, Ephesians 2 is going to say that he seated us in the heavens in Christ so that in the ages to come he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God's already been there. He's already done that. He already remembers it. And he knows you uh, in that way. And all events in time and space are being worked out to that end uh, by God's hand. He's all over it. Now, does that mean that he authored the negative things? Well, there's some mystery. No, but he uses it all. He uses it all. There's some freedom somehow. And yet God knows it all and uses it all. And he's perfectly has the right to do that. He's the sovereign. Um, some people get offended at this notion. But God, that's God's right. Now, we still are accountable to believe. We still, uh, you know, believing makes a difference. His grace is not irresistible, like the Calvinists say. And he didn't choose some people to not be saved. No. For those who do believe, he already knows us. And he's prepared an inheritance for us. And actually, the word predestination is only used three times in the Bible. And in each case, it's not related to salvation per se. It's related to sonship and inheritance. In Ephesians here, it's used uh, in verse 5. He predest In love, he predestinated us unto sonship by Christ Jesus to himself, to the praise of the glory of his grace, according to the good pleasure of his will. Uh, it's, it's a predestination unto sonship. And then Romans 8 says, those who be predestinated... Uh, we know that all things work together for good uh, to those who are, love God and are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to become conformed, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. It's, again, it's sonship and glorification. And then in Ephesians 1.11, it says, in whom we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestinated. Predestination has to do with working everything out for your good, for the sons of God, to bring them into the enjoyment of their inheritance. Predestination includes the ages to come, uh, the exploits that we will do with our Father, and the kindnesses that He's going to shower on us in Christ. And predestination is something that's in Christ. It only exists in Christ, and at, and Christ was predestinated. But it is all about the sonship. So, uh, we're we're way beyond. You know, did God know the people who who don't get saved? You know, honestly, He doesn't. It, they are chaff, uh, blown away in the wind and forgotten. Uh, we are significant because our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And uh, God knows us in Christ and has a history with us of love that we to, we are just being introduced to. But it, I, I liken it to time travel, like God came back from the future and introduced himself to us after having spent all these ages with us. And uh, I did a message about a year and a half ago called God Coming Back in Time to Save Those He Loves. If you want to know how God knows you, you really can't, but it's very intimate and it's based on a history that you have yet to experience that he already has. Um, so predestination plays a big part in Ephesians because Ephesians is the book that reveals God's eternal purpose, which is his called his good pleasure, his kind intention. It is what he had in his heart before the world began. Before he created anything, this is the why he created it. And everything he's done, he's foreknown. 
and he knows exactly what the outcome is. And the outcome is many sons in glory, the body of Christ, which is Christ's fullness, which is God's inheritance. Christ himself is multiplied in the church. Um, and that's another thing. The focus is Christ. You know, we are so self-focused, but God uh, predestined everything for Christ because he is the heir. And Colossians will talk about that, but he, God created all things in Christ, for Christ. He's the heir of all things. Everything is for him. He is the beloved son of God. He is the one the Father loves, and God knows us, as we'll see, in Christ. Everything that we are to God is in Christ. The way we relate to God is through Christ. The way God sees us is through his Son. And we're accepted in the Beloved. And this is good news for us when it comes to justification, because it means that it's not based on our merits, it's based on the perfect virtues of the Son, that are a prism through which God sees us. Not a prison, a prism through which God sees us. God sees us in Christ. He only knows us in Christ. He doesn't know us apart from Christ. And some people don't like that. But, uh, you know, the Pharisees didn't like that. They, they wanted to have the kingdom without the heir, right? And Jesus gave the parable about, he said, you know, God will, God will send... He sent servants and they killed him, them, and he sent prophets and they killed them. And then he said, well, I'll send my son, they'll receive him. And they said, here's the heir, let's kill him and take his inheritance. We don't want God apart from Christ if we really know God's heart. We want what God wants, which is Christ. And we are known in Christ and we are blessed in Christ and we're benefited in Christ but it's all for Christ. So we see that in Ephesians 2 as well, you know. Um, so Paul, an apostle by, of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, that's the first thing, is the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. And to know if you're faithful, it just means do you believe? Do you still believe the message that you believed when you got saved? Yes. Okay, you're faithful. You're obedient to the truth. And you're a saint, which means you've been sanctified by God. You are. He doesn't call them, hopefully you're going to be saints. You know? No, they are saints. <laughs> but, oh yeah, uh, this, this church got the most attention. We've got Ephesians, the letter in Ephesus to the bride of, maiden of choice, which is the bride of Christ which is, this letter reveals the bride of Christ. First and second Timothy were written to Timothy while he was in pastoring Ephesus, dealing with all their problems. And first through third John were written in Ephesus because after, uh, after John got off the island of Patmos, he went back to Ephesus. And it's interesting because God promised the overcomers he, he, they needed to return to their first love. He said, you know, I have this one thing against you, you've left your first love, which is not your love for Christ but Christ's love for you. Um, and I think we'll talk more about this in Ephesians 4 when we get to the winds of doctrine and stuff, but that church had to deal with all the false doctrines and everything, uh, which spoiled they got them in such a fighting mode that it spoiled their enjoyment of Christ as the bridegroom. And so John wrote to the maiden of choice on Patmos and said, you know, you need to return your first love. And he said to him who overcomes, I'll give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Well, John went to Ephesus after Patmos. And what did he write? He wrote that which is from the beginning. First John is a book to help them return to the basics and return specifically to in this is love not that we love God but that he loved us <clears throat> and to Christ as the word of life who is the tree of life and is our nourishment and also the gospel of John <coughs> was written in Ephesus and the focus of the gospel of John it's a book for the church that emphasizes the bridegroom the wedding 
uh, feast, right? The first miracle was the miracle of Cana, the wine, the enjoyment of Christ, and Christ is presented in all these different ways as satisfaction because they had gotten so burnt out from fighting all the false apostles that their hearts had grown cold. So that just shows how much attention is given to Ephesus. Ephesus uh, is a blessed church in God's heart. Um, and it's because it's through Ephesus that God chose to reveal a lot about the mystery of Christ and what his intention is and what his heart is. Ephesus is, Ephesians is where we see God's heart opened up. Not our heart. It's not our love. It's his love. Um, okay, so that I did feel like I needed to speak a little bit to how much attention they got. There's a whole story with Ephesus that's amazing, but uh, I'm sure we'll touch it more when we get to Ephesians 4. Um, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and for the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is God himself in Christ, giving himself to you. Remember, in Ephesians 2 again, it says he raised us up, uh, seated us in the heavenlies in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show forth the riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ. And uh, in Ephesians 1, it talks about how our sonship is to the praise of the glory of his grace. God's interested in putting his grace on display. And grace is not just a static thing. It's not just his feeling towards us. It's God moving towards us in kindness and showering us with himself and with his blessedness, with all that he is. It's him giving himself to us fully. Uh, in John, it sa John chapter 1, it says, Of his fullness we've all received grace upon grace. Grace is God in Christ as the Spirit coming to you and doing all these wondrous things to make you his habitation, his inheritance, uh, his glory, his masterpiece, his building, his bride, uh, and the many sons of God. And to put Christ on display in this uh, crea new creation. Um, so that's grace and then peace, you know. Do you see that God is at peace with you? Um, I'm working on these messages. I'm typing them up for the book uh, on discipline. And in one of the messages, I talk about how we need to be reconciled to God, but God has already reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. He's at peace. It's our mind that's alienated. And what we need is a vision to see that God is satisfied with us and that he loves us and that his intentions are only good towards us. Uh, that's what keeps us alienated is, is lack of vision and unbelief, lack of understanding of God's heart and his redemption and his focus. Uh, so grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That title is in Colossians as well, and that's actually fairly unique. Uh, in most of the epistles, it's blessed be God, but blessed, you know, th I thank my God. It's my God. And, but in Colossians and Ephesians, the phrase the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is used to describe God. And that is who he is. And that is the essence of his heart. How is God identified? If you, you know, I am the father of our Lord Jesus. Uh, uh, he's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if I'm not that proud of my son and my son is not my focus. If I, if you, I, if you say, who are you? I'll say, I'm, a, I'm David Benjamin. I'm a musician. I have a YouTube channel. In fact, a lot of times I do that. You know, I, I identify myself apart from my child. But God doesn't identify himself apart from Christ. That shows how focused he is on Christ. Who is he? He's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. No one has known the Father, no one has seen the Father, only the only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father has revealed him. No one knows the Father except the Son, and to him he chooses to reveal him. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He is the focus. 
God has not done anything apart from Christ ever. We see that through the whole Bible. I mean, that's what it means that he's the triune God. They're three in one. They co here. Everything they do is together as one. And everything the Father has is focused on the Son, and everything the Son does is to glorify the Father. Uh, and God is glorified in the Son and put on display in the Son. All the riches of what God has done are for Christ, are accomplished by Christ, are upheld in Christ, and are put on display through Christ. And that's how we know God. We'll always know the Father through the Son. So he's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it says he's blessed. And we'll see that this is not only about our inheritance and our position and our destiny. This is about God's blessing. What he is reaping. What he is receiving. You know, as the result of what he's doing. Which again is all focused on Christ. If you want to know God's satisfaction, it's Christ. So how is God pleased and what is the good pleasure of his will? Well, it has to do with Christ. The church is, is for Christ and Christ is put on display in the church. The church is for Christ. You are for Christ. Uh, if you don't understand that, then you don't understand why you're here and you're going to end up with frustration. We need to have a re- framing of our vision to see that everything is for Christ we exist for him and God is pleased to put him on display he's not interested in your sanctification your holiness, your good behavior your virtue he's interested in Christ and then he gives us Christ to be our life our righteousness, our sanctification our virtue eventually our expression, our behavior and our glory we, we get fulfilled when we live for the purpose for which we were created, which is Christ. Uh, okay, so blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That's everything. All of the promises of God, realized or not, are yes and amen in Christ. Everything God does for the righteous is available to us in Christ. Every good thing that God has is ours in Christ. He brought us into the household and made us heirs with him and gave us access to everything. Jesus said, all that the Father has mine, all, all has the Father has is mine, and the Spirit will make it manifest to you. As the heir, he has the right to distribute everything, and he is distributing the blessing of the Father's house, which is all the riches of, of the Father's house, and everything that the Father has is ours. It's, you know, we could say the words, but to really understand it, we, we need the ages to come for him to shower the riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ, right? Uh then we'll be able to speak to these things. Right now, we can speak about redemption. We can speak about the forgiveness of sins. We can speak that we're sons of God. We can say we've received the Spirit. We know we have eternal life. But a lot of these things are by faith, and, and they're things we hope. But in the ages to come, we're going to have a different kind of story, where we're going to have a different kind of vocabulary to describe what God has given us in Christ. And it's everything. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And remember in Galatians, we saw that we are heirs and that the blessing of Abraham has come upon us because we're in Christ. That's why we were baptized into Christ. We've put him on and are therefore Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And the promise is the promise of the Spirit. The Spirit is the way that God makes everything that's in Christ available to us subjectively. And we are heirs of the Spirit, and we are blessed. Um, this is the blessing. Which is, in Ephesians 1, the seal of the Spirit and the pledge. And the pledge is the guarantee of the inheritance. It's a foretaste. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we're blessed. Now, we're not cursed. We're not partially blessed. 
We don't have to do anything to earn the blessing. We are already blessed. We have been blessed. Past tense. He has blessed us. Remember, in God's eyes, it's all done. He has already done it. It's absolutely secure. So don't let anybody teach you that being blessed of God is something incremental that you need to earn, you know, uh, that you need to, uh, if you don't tithe, you won't be blessed, or I'm blessed because I do this and that. No, we're blessed because of Christ, for Christ, and in Christ, because God is blessed, having done this, right? We are blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Again, it's in Christ, not apart from Christ. So that's why we need to see ourselves in Christ and we need to learn to live in Christ according to the Spirit. According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blemish before Him in love. Now He's describing the blessing. Part of the blessing is being uh, holy and without blemish before Him in love. That means it's God's work to make us holy. It's his blessing. It's something he gives. Not something we strive to or attain through our merits or efforts or struggling. It's given to us in Christ. We're to rest in it by faith. We can frustrate it through unbelief, but we grow in it and rest in it by faith. But either way, God has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, which means he knew us, to be holy and without blemish. It says without blame, and that's good, without reproach, but it's also without blemish. And that means we're going to be without spot before him, <laughs> literally. But remember, God sees us through the prism of Christ, and his virtue is credited to us in God's sight so that we are without spot. God is not looking you at you as a messy sinner. He's looking at you as the righteousness of God in Christ. With Christ as your righteousness and Christ as your life and Christ as your sanctification. Christ as the way that God knows you. And he's your holiness. And you are without spot in Christ. Uh, praise God. Um, and then it says, in love having predestinated us. We already talked about that word a little bit. Unto the sonship. Or adoption of children. But I like sonship. It can be said that way. Adoption is, I wasn't in the family and now I am in the family legally. But sonship also includes the fact that I'm actually born of God. I actually do have his life. I'm a partaker of the divine nature. I have his seed in me. I have his DNA. And I'm destined to be like him. I'm going to be glorified with Christ. I'm going to be conformed to the image of the Son. That's the actual sonship is when we're glorified with Christ. So we are not just adopted, we are also genetic. Um, but being predestinated means that everything in time and space is working for this good. Everything in time and space, everything we encounter, every person, place, and thing, good or bad, is all being worked together by God for our good. We are the clay, he is the potter, and he's our father, and he loves us in Christ. And he's working on us. We are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece. And he's using it all. That's what predestination says to me. But I don't, I don't, it, you know, for those who reject predestination, they are rejecting the intense attention to us that the Father has given himself for as members of Christ. Uh, that he, his whole attention, his focus with intensity is upon us. That, that shows me his love and his energy towards me. Uh, I don't want to miss that. I mean, I've met people that argue as much as they can that God did not know us. He actually blinded himself to us so that we could have, to preserve our freedom of choice. And that's a Western thing that we we overly sanctify man's freedom at the expense of God's knowledge. You know, no, he knows us. He chose us before the foundation of the world, before the world began. He saw us as without spot, 
He chose us in Christ. Choosing, by the way, has to do with fruit bearing and holiness. And predestination has to do with sonship and inheritance. Our enjoyment of Christ um, and in our position. Whereas choosing, if you look at it through the Bible, you see Peter uses it too. Choosing seems to be related to how God has set us apart in sanctification for himself and put us in a place where we are without blemish. Choosing is really special, but then predestination is how he works it out. Um, and this is by the by Jesus Christ to himself. Again, predestination is not about you individually. It's about Christ. Um, and it's to himself through Jesus Christ that we're his children because we are his inheritance. He's blessed through this, remember. Uh, according to the good pleasure of his will, which is, as we'll see in Ephesians, is his eternal purpose, which is, in some translations, it's called the kind intention. But good pleasure is good. This is what God's delight is. We're talking about the Father's delight. No other book reveals the Father's heart the way Ephesians does, I, I believe, with these, this kind of language. Um, to the praise of the glory of his grace in which he's made us accepted in the beloved. There's his grace put on display. Like I said, his grace is not just his feeling towards us. Grace is God himself moving towards us to accomplish everything. And he's putting that on display. He's not putting your holiness on display. He's not putting your virtue on display. He's not putting your good works on display. He's putting Christ on display. He's putting God himself in Christ as the spirit towards you as a blessing on display. And it's gl glorious. And it won't be fully displayed until the ages to come when he's showering the riches of his grace on us in kindness. And it's a crescendo that goes on forever. We only know a little bit, a t foretaste now. But It'll always be getting better. I believe our tomorrow is always going to be better than today. The lat path of the righteous is brighter and brighter and brighter. And God's going to be, able, we're going to be in a position for God to reveal himself in grace and kindness towards us more and more and more and more and more forever. You know, every time he turns, there's a new facet that he's going to reveal. And each facet may take an entire new age or dispensation to teach. You know, he's teaching the angels right now about his mercy and compassion, that, which is something they could never see before he created this world. Man fell and he came and incarnated himself and became one of us in weakness to identify himself with us in order to taste death for us and bring us home to glory. And through all that, there is an entire... Uh, range of virtues of God that the angels had never known before that took have that are taking thousands of years for him to reveal well there's virtues in God that are infinite that we've never even heard of before the angels had never considered compassion meekness kindness lowliness mercy before they didn't need it right but now they see it through us and what we're going through is he brings us into the sonship. Uh, what's he going to do in the next age? What things of God and virtues is he going to put on display? And what's he going to have to do to do that? Now, there won't be negative things anymore. Sin and all that will never happen again. But there will be positive displays of who God is through dispensations and ages to come. His plan is... I, we can't even fathom what's in store for us, you know. But it's all according to the good pleasure of his will. This is what he purposed in eternity past. Before he did anything, is to have many children who are just like Christ and have everything that he has and in whom Christ is actually put on display. This is the glory of his grace in which he's made us accepted in the beloved. We are acceptable to him, accepted in the beloved son. Now look at all the, this is what we call positional truth, meaning it's all what God has done for us in Christ and it's based on Christ, not on, on us, right? He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He's chosen us in him bef uh, and we're holy without blemish before him. Well, that's actually the father in love. 
He predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. And then we're accepted in the beloved. Then it's going to say, in whom we have redemption of sins. Uh, and we'll get to that in the next message. But the point is, is it's all in Christ. God does not see you apart from Christ. He doesn't handle you apart from Christ. And we said in Galatians that the sonship, we, we become more and more like our father as we learn to deal with everything in Christ. God is already learning to deal with everything in Christ. Not, not learning. He already deals with everything in Christ. And the way we are like God is in that we deal with everything in Christ. Godliness is Christ. And becoming like God is to deal with everything in Christ. And that means we need to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We need to see him. And right now we're seeing that he's the center of God's heart and he's the center of our destiny. Uh, okay. Again, I'm speaking very emphatically and strongly because I'm trying to finish as much as I can before I reach my destination. It seems like my car is the best place to do these messages. Uh, talk to you soon.